I would like to very much welcome everybody who's uh, on the call now to our Nuclear Futures online event, so Nuclear Futures in conversation with. Um, before I do a proper introduction to the event, um, in terms of what we're trying to do, I'd like to just hand over to Joe Deville. Um, for all, he's the director of the Centre of Science Studies, who's going to um, just do a bit of an introduction about um, the emerging STS um, series of events that this is a part of. So, Joe, over to you, please. Uh, yeah, thanks so much, Louise. And I just wanted to first of all actually say thanks so much to the organisers, to uh, to Louise and to Jade for really putting on such an amazing series of events in the face um, uh, of uh, challenges of doing things digitally, but also um, floods um, and, um, and and various other and challenges. So yeah, it's been really a fantastic series that I've been kind of observing and somewhat from afar, unfortunately. I really want to be there at that first event, but I couldn't. Um, uh, and I think it's, yeah, really testament to you guys that you've managed to put on such a uh, really interesting series that explores really relevant questions in such a creative and thought-provoking way. So thank you so much for that. Yeah, as Louise mentioned, um, the event or the series of events is funded by, it's actually funded by the residues of some uh, the money that the CSS, CSS has allocated for hosting the East Conference some years ago. And one of the things that I and my colleagues in the CSS have been keen to do is to use those funds to support uh, what we call emerging STS. So work from uh, earlier career scholars um, working to uh, working with questions in and around science studies at and beyond Lancaster and I think these series of events really speaks to the possibilities of that and it's something that we hope to be able to continue to do in the coming years. Uh, the event itself fits really well with some of the themes that we are interested in within the CSS, energy, techno-scientific futures, um, potentially even uh, disasters and, 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 and the environment so um, yeah it's a perfect event I think to showcase what we're doing at the centre and yeah thanks so much and I'll hand it over to Louise and to Jade and I'll turn my camera off. Thank you so much um, Joe uh, not only for the intro but also for for the funding it's allowed us to do all this kind of uh, uh, slightly interesting things. I think there's certainly a deviation from my normal work um, professionally and also to a degree um, with my PhD. So thank you very much for attending this evening's online event um, and joining us to hear more about the Nuclear Futures project as a whole. So the aim of today's session is to share with you some of the outputs of um, that series of events that we've put on, um, where we explore nuclear pasts, presents and futures in relation to the northwest of England. Uh, as many of you will know, uh, I know that we've got various uh, Lancaster residents and um, uh, on, on the call today. Um, Lancaster and the northwest of England, Cumbria, Lancashire, has got a very interesting relationship with nuclear things um, as a whole. Uh, and that's what we wanted to explore with this project, potentially doing this in a slightly more unusual um, way that brought together a whole host of different stakeholders and people with an interest from residents, policymakers, scientists, emergency planners, physicists, ethnographers, uh, creative writers and, and all sorts of things. So um, before I go on to the project, I should just probably introduce myself. I know um, a few of you know me already, but um, my name is Louise Alstow. I'm a PhD researcher at Lancaster's sociology department, and my own research engages with um, the construction of scientific knowledge around radiation con and contamination in particular. Um, my project partner is Jade, and I'll let her introduce herself um, in more detail in just a second. Um, we also worked with Maria Pansadu on the initial um, uh, nuclear futures event, which was held in October. So that initial um, at that initial event, we wanted to bring together people to explore this world of nuclear past, presents and futures in relation to um, to uh, Cumbria and Lancaster. And um, we wanted to do that, as I said, in, in a, um, an explorative uh, way, bringing together probably people who might not have those kinds of conversations under normal circumstances. 
Um, so we had intended to um, start the day off in, in Lancaster University, do some work with Philippa, and then kind of collect various people who were based up in, um, in Cumbria on the way on a sort of mini radiation monitoring tour and ref reflective practice um, tour around various parts of Cumbria. Unfortunately, the weather of the northwest was against us on the day, uh, and we were thwarted by not one but two weather warnings. Um, various floods and road closures and things. And Petra Titska, who's uh, I'm, I'm really glad is able to be here with us today, was unable to, to participate because she was uh, marooned in Cumbria uh, and wasn't able to join us. So we sort of, uh, we were able to persevere and we gathered together um, probably about half of the group that we were intending to um, speak to on the day. Um, and we had a fantastic day actually working with Philippa and exploring some of these um, things that we'll, we'll look at um, in just a second. Um, so just to sort of engage on what, what we did as a result of that is that we then looked at the different um, artefacts that we collected, the reflections that we'd made. Um, and again, Philippa and Jade will talk about, um, talk through some more um, about what we produced as a result. But um, we did host recently uh, a mini exhibition in the story in Lancaster um, City Centre, where we um, were able to display some of those um, works um, for public access, which is really important and part of um, the legacy or rather part of the public engagement of this series of events was to try and get people to um, think about it and to hopefully cause them to um, reflect and think about their own relationships with nuclear things. So I'm delighted at this point to be able to hand over to Jade. So Jade's going to talk us through um, some of the artefacts that we uh, we generated for that exhibition, um, at which point or after that, we'll then come over to Philippa, who will talk through um, one of the other collective outputs that we generated, which is a fantastic collective poem um, made from all of our combined efforts. But again, Philippa will be able to explain that in much better detail than I will do. Um, and then I'll round off with a collective map that we've been generating as well. We might all speak to different bits, by the way, they might overlap. You'll see things emerging um, across all different um, aspects of things. So um, at that point, then we'll hand over to Petra Jitska, who will give us a bit of a reflection on what she's seen and heard and thought about as a result. Um, and then we'll round off the end of the session um, with a bit of a QA and a uh, and any reflections that you might have in the audience as well. So um, at this point, then, um, Jade, if you'd like to introduce yourself and tell us a bit more about your own research. And then if you can start us off with um, talking through the artefacts and our ends of sentences, please. And at this point, I'll go on mute and I'll take my camera off. Yes. So hi, everyone. My name is Jade and I am a material science researcher in the Department of Engineering. And uh, I'm also part of the uh, Material Social Futures CDT here at Lancaster, uh, where we look at how the um, societal and the technical intertwine. So how, how do they inform each other? And um, it, it was really interesting to be part of this project, first of all, no, not only because, you know, we're really looking at the way the Northwest is connected with its nuclear present and history and especially its future, but we're also looking at people's personal um, connections to radiation, nuclear energy and so on. Um, Louise, are you OK to share your share the slides? Perfect. Yeah, can you let me know if you can see them? Yes, I can. I'll be this. Okay. So first of all, um, Louise very kindly donated some pictures to our um, artefacts and in, in the exhibition we were able to display these uh, in the story cafe on the wall. So first of all, uh, you know, we really see this connection again um, with the with the personal. You know, Louise talks about um, cycling along a path uh, that you can see in this picture. But also she talks about how you can't see some of the things as well, what's visible and what's invisible. Um, so, you know, the fact that Sellafield is hidden, but you very much know that it's there as well is such a, um, a very 
uh, uh, deep connection to where you are, where you were possibly in that moment in time and what you know of your surroundings. Um, so although you can't see it, you know that it's there. Uh, and if you go on to the next slide. Uh, OK, yeah, so here you can see it. It's in plain sight. And again, this really speaks volumes to, um, for Louise's personal connections to uh, nuclear power. And uh, these sets of images are really nice because, you know, contrasting the visible and the invisible enables um, for it allows you to have a reflection of your own uh, history and your own way of interacting with uh, nuclear energy now, in the past and in the future. Uh, next slide, please, Louise. And this was really cool. So uh, Nikki created a Geiger counter. And what's especially important about this uh, Geiger counter is the portability of it. You can see from the carrying handle that you can, uh, you know, basically go anywhere and interact with the uh, uh, radioact the radioactivity of your surroundings. And what else, is, uh, what is also really cool is that as you can see at the bottom, it doesn't even go blip. That's because um, you see that that protruding thing at the end of the uh, turquoisey uh, block. So that goes onto uh, some some surface in your surroundings, uh, so that you can really feel it going in and out. So that it taps on your surroundings, and uh, yeah, this is this is also. Um, uh, an example of having a personal connection with your uh, surroundings is in, in terms of radiation because you get to have a very geographical um, personal uh, way of interacting with your <laughs> surroundings by using this Geiger counter. So um, yeah, really, really cool uh, device. Thank you, Nikki. And then Finally, we have uh, Professor Paul Leonard's Winkles that he collected from Sellafield. And if I recall correctly, uh, these Winkles were sampled to um, get their, uh, to see how much uh, radioactivity they had. Correct me if I'm wrong, <laughs> Louise, but um, yeah, he goes into more detail in his paper, but yeah, that's correct. So they they were picked from um, from a beach just down the road from Sellafield, um, and then I, I love the fact that they're sort of winkles from the nineteen eighties. Um, uh, yeah, and that went into um, the reduction of uh, radionuclide discharges from Sellafield. The result of this paper. So we've got some sort of historic legacy winkles making radioactive discharge visible, but in different ways. Yeah, and I think it's also um, important to see how we interact with um, the other, uh, you know, with the ecology here as well. How do they play a part in our uh, nuclear history and what can they say about our nuclear futures? So if we go on to the next slide, we should have some ends of sentences. So Louise and I um, put out a uh, call for people to provide their ends of sentences for the um, sentence when I think about the Northwest's nuclear past, present and future. And these are just a few selections of the, you know, a wide range of responses that we got. And you can see that there's um, really a spectrum of how people think about their own, uh, not just their own, but in general, the Northwest's nuclear past, present and future, you know, and Louise's, um, uh, I see you've highlighted there the, the like really important words. So, you know, feeling proud, looming infrastructure, 
you know, what can we say, say for future generations and future societies and, you know, cleaner options, then these words, these are words that we can hear, um, you know, quite commonly in nuclear discourses that are happening currently and, you know, which also help to help us to think about how we might imagine a nuclear future. And with that, I shall pass you on to Philippa. Hi. Hi, Hi Philippa. You can see me. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this project. Um, just a little introduction of myself. Um, so I'm an author and I'm also a senior lecturer in creative writing at Stafford University. Um, and my specialism is nuclear psychogeography. So I look at how nuclear landscapes inform the emotions and behaviours of people who are in those landscapes. And I'm particularly interested in the communities um, who live in landscapes where there are nuclear power stations. Um, and as it's already been shown in these artefacts so far, um, there, there's, it's a complex, a complex response that people have, um, often conflicting emotions, um, and different ways of looking at things. I'm particularly interested in some of the ideas that have come through from this project in terms of things like the visible and the invisible, the need for mediating technology to help us um, read certain things in the landscapes. Um, and that, that difference between seeing something conceptually and seeing something visually, so the physical and the, the kind of conceptual. Um, the project that I uh, worked with, the plan was that I was going to run some psychogeography, um, some practical psychogeography when we went on our trip up towards um, Drig and Sellafield, and unfortunately the weather um, stopped us going up there. Uh, so instead we, we did some kind of reflective psychogeography. So Psychogeography is, is about really defamiliarizing familiar spaces or seeing spaces and taking a kind of metacognitive approach to questioning how they make us feel and how they make us behave. So the part of the project that um, I was working with the participants on was to then because we couldn't go out and physically respond to these landscapes, we were discussing the emotional and behavioural response based on reflecting on how we interact with those landscapes. Um, so it's really interesting. There were people who worked at Sellafield, there were people who um, worked in nuclear sciences, there were residents from the area, obviously the PhD students studying uh, nuclear issues. Um, and we did a number of activities um, involving uh, looking at maps of the area and jotting down sort of initial responses to that sort of mapping out emotions and feelings um, and bits of local knowledge or work based knowledge onto those maps. Uh, we then did some exercises where I invited people to um, just reflect on the physical nature of one aspect of that landscape, whether it was outdoors or indoors at work or at home, and to just jot down some of the sensory details from that space. So that involved uh, things that you could smell, hear, touch, feel, um, sort of even taste in the air. And I know that sounds silly, but when you live by the sea or you live in the countryside, you can quite often taste things in the air. Um, and to develop from that, to start thinking about the future and to start thinking about um, writing up short scenes and passages in which those descriptions came into play in, in more of a prose um, passage and then to, to sort of project forwards and to think about where we see those landscapes being, how we see those landscapes being in the future, uh, to sort of speculate forwards um, for our hopes and fears really in terms of um, in terms of the nuclear industry and in terms of how those landscapes might change within our lifetime or beyond our lifetime. And then everybody was very generous with their work. They allowed me to either take their notes away or take photos of their notes. And from this, um, I developed a poem. So um, I call this kind of curation of other people's work into a new form of poem, a fusion poem. So it involves kind of reading through um, multiple times, really familiarising yourself with other people's notes and little um, 
sort of the details people have picked out, the feelings, the emotions they have about certain places, the de descriptions of certain places, um, and then seeing how they interact with one another and starting to tease out of that some kind of narrative or connections or links, effectively finding passages that collide and create a kind of a literary energy, I suppose. Um, so I was able from this wonderful raw material that everybody produced in these sessions that was just so honest and open and um, willing to participate, I was able to bring together a poem um, reflecting on that. Is it possible? Has it, is it possible to get the poem upon the screen? Yeah, it's so beautiful, I doubt. Is it, is it possible to do that? Because I can read it. Um, yeah, no problem. I think I've it's nice to see it as well. You. Yeah, hold on a second. So just while Louise is getting that set up, it's important to note that every single word of this poem, all of the words came from the participants, so none of the words in it are mine at all. All I've done is go through the raw material and bring those words together into a single space. Um, so you can see the authors are listed um, down the right hand side of the page. Uh, these are the people who joined in with the activities and um, were very happy to share their notes and their little pieces of prose and their thoughts and ideas. And so my role is not to have my voice in the poem, but to bring all those voices together into a kind of a polyphonic exploration of um, both the place, the landscape itself, um, in the northwest and also the concepts of nuclear and what that means to people what it means to people in communities what it means to people as individuals uh, the difference between being a visitor and being a resident being a worker all of those things so would you like me to read it out we'd love you to okay <laughs> i shall do my best to read it out um so the poem the title of the poem is also taken from um some of the notes as well. So it's called Spilled Tea and Plutonium, a poem for the nuclear age, Whitehaven to Lancaster, 2020. Um, so, local population. We are a tiny resident in the whole history and future of existence. Traffic moving slowly, missing a family, proud, familiar, interesting how people respond. Use of the areas, ozone, wind, sun, everything labelled, shiny pins and braces, black graphite sleeves. I can walk freely in most spaces, but must have lid on tea to go downstairs. Sea levels rise, flooding, watch feet and hands, wellies, children on the beach, an expectation that I know what to do, business-like stance, waiting. Recreation, seabirds, people talking, quiet anticipation, the ice cream van and signage everywhere. Contamination, flat dead light in the ponds, sewage outlets and winkle picking. Locals build up an immunity, but look out for visitors, be a shepherd to the party. Energy and acceptance, what are our feelings? A barrier? Unknowable depths. But you can be, but also not be, some areas are out of bounds, not for everyone. Industrialization, a tiny core smaller than a nut, proximity to so many borders. The high fences are part of the furniture that I don't even think to look behind. Interconnectivity, some of us are baked in part of the landscape, some nomadic in the midst of our nuclear families, us and them. Treat it as an in-between space, hold close the creations. Future. What we're experiencing now becomes folklore. No more golf ball, no more ponds. Instead, a grassed hill, a heritage trail. The new UK's nuclear past vitrified. Safety, risk, reward. Remember the little dangers. Poisonous plants, sharpened stones. There is stability in the small steps taken. So huge well done to all the amazing contributors and the words that they provided for that poem, because just 
absolute stunning observations. So uh, huge thanks to Professor Paul Leonard, Jade Lee, Louise Estelle, Maria Pantasudu, Dominic Harrison, Julia Grime and Laura Kay for their generosity in sharing their thoughts and feelings. Um, I think we're doing Q&A later, so I think it's time to pass over to Louise. Sorry. Thank you very much. And I should apologise. Um, thank you for reading out that. That was really beautiful. And thank you so much for all the effort that you put into it. I should apologise because I was going to do a proper introduction of you, I think. But... <laughs> it's OK. I know you did say you wanted me to talk about my book as well. It's actually the release date of my novel today. Please do. It's my publication birthday today. Um, so here's the book, The Half-Life of Snails. Um, and this novel is a novel that I developed um, using nuclear psychogeography. So I spent a lot of time in the landscape around Wilver Nuclear Power Station where I used to live and I was often sent to work at Wilver as a health and safety instructor. Um, and also I went to Chernobyl and spent time doing um, psychogeographic practice in the exclusion zone. And I spent time with the self settlers there, um, hearing their stories and learning about the, the legacy of nuclear accident um, and sort of a, exploring the community and placed responses to nuclear power, the plans for Wilver B um, and the closure of uh, the Wilver nuclear power station decommissioning process. Um, and so the novel drew, came out of that really. And um, it's a, a naughty little novel. It's it's looking at how those anxieties can inform people's behaviour. Um, I'll put a link up to it in the chat. I hate self promotion, so I feel very, very awkward about doing this. Um, but Louise asked me to mention it, so um, I thought I probably on behalf of my publishers should say something. Um, but obviously, if anyone's got any questions about the poem or the process that we went through or the book, then please um, just grab me at some point. Thank you, Louise. No problem. Thank you so much. It would have been an absolute travesty to have not given you that opportunity. Um, and uh, I know Philip has introduced herself properly already, um, but we, we couldn't have asked for a better partner in terms of um, a creative writer than, than Philippa, given her background and, um, uh, and knowledge about nuclear things, as well as the creative writing process. So um, we were really, really fortunate to have found her um, and we're really thankful for um, such a wonderful output from her. Um, at this point, I'm actually going to hand over to um, Dr. Petra Chitska Kautzhoven, um, who is a cultural anthropologist from the University of Manchester. She's been there since 2007. Uh, she draws on a background that combines humanities and social sciences to explore skilled manifestations of human curiosity, simulation, play and rhetoric. And as a member of the University of Manchester's Social Science and Nuclear Research Network, the BEAM, um, she's been there since 2017 and she has a, um, a fascinating insight into um, what's going on at Sellafield um, because her um, interest it, um, she pursues an interest in expertise, materials and landscapes whilst doing an ethnography um, on site at Sellafield, looking at nuclear decommissioning in West Cumbria. So at this point, um, Petra Chitska, are you, are you there? You are. Fabulous. I'm here. Thank you so much, Louise, for this very <laughs> kind introduction. Thanks. Thank you. Are you. Let me know if you need any help with your sharing. Right, yes, I'm, I thought uh, I'll prepare some slides and I will talk uh, through my own experience uh, whilst reflecting on uh, on the wonderful outputs that you just uh, just showed. So I'm going to share now, hoping that that works out. Can you see that? Yes. Yes. OK, great. Yeah. So uh, so as Louisa mentioned, over the past five years, um, I've been doing an ethnographic project around uh, Sellafield in West Cumbria at and around Sellafield. Uh, it was called uh, Holistic Decommissioning in the Nuclear Industry. And I'm about to wrap it up because I'm going uh, to do another project related to it, um, which actually started this weekend. Um, so what I did over these past five years was uh, 
core anthropological methods, really, uh, using participant observation and uh, ethnography. I moved from Manchester to uh, Whitehaven, where I've lived for the past five years to be fully immersed in the project. And I was looking uh, both at uh, internal dyna dynamics at Sellafield, um, and I saw that um, at the uh, earlier workshop that you did, where unfortunately I, I couldn't be because of the, the, the problems with the weather and everything, um, the term heterotopia was mentioned. And I thought that was really uh, striking because indeed, if you, if you look at Sellafield, it's, um, it's kind of a, a village in itself, but um, with very different elements and different groupings within it. But I guess uh, most of what I did was about Sellafield external dynamics, so how it functions in its West Cumbrian landscape and context. By the way, I had access, I still have access to the site, which uh, Sellafield Limited kindly, uh, kindly gave me, which was very useful, of course, uh, in terms of uh, landscapes and trying to get a feel for, uh, for the place. Um, I'm trying to get to my next... Um, slide for now it's not working any advice on that louise um if you normally if you just click on the screen when you're on the slide it should move it forward otherwise there are often at the bottom yeah. little arrows um, left and right okay great i clicked and um i hope you see my uh, my second slide now so what really struck me in the collective outputs and that really resonates with, uh, with what I've seen in my fieldwork is these entanglements that are there. I mean, the nuclear and um, its context and the, the landscape it sits in, it's all very much entangled um, environmentally, socioeconomically, materially, technologically, aesthetically also effectively because there's all these people that work there um, and have friends and family working there so so there's there's really intimate relations there's also sensory um, entanglements and I thought it was very interesting just now um, when you mentioned um, Nikki's um, Geiger counter and how it tries to to engage sensorially with uh, with the landscape that's that's there and then there's also educational political institutional relations and of course relations through time because the nuclear industry has been there for quite a while of course and what what i found striking is that presence of the nuclear could be seen as both enabling and constraining. The nuclear makes a lot possible in the area. It also um, puts people in a certain frame of mind from which it's perhaps sometimes difficult to uh, to escape. So that that ambivalence, I think, you also see in the um, in the remarks made in the collective outputs. I. Um, I put a few of them there that I found striking, the tensions and dichotomies, a strange and brave technology, pride was mentioned a couple of times, but also an accumulation of risk without end. So quite, quite ambivalent really, and quite, quite different reactions to, uh, to the nuclear. What, what I've done myself, what I've used as a metaphor in an article which is coming out uh, this month, which might be out there right now, is that I thought of uh, West Cumbria as a will fall. That is the environment that you get when a will uh, carcass is decomposing. You get all kinds of organisms that live of that will. So um, Sellafield Limited could be seen as a will carcass that is now, of course, um, being decommissioned. There's habitat there and uh, the nuclear industry often, try, often tends to conceive of the area as depending on the nuclear but with that metaphor of a will fall, I think you get something much more um, interdependent. There's a mutual dependence there. There's kinship in eating the will carcass, in consuming it, 
you also become part of it. So I thought that was an interesting way to uh, to go about thinking um, of Sellafield in its uh, context. It's all about these relations through time, uh, which change over time. So the carcass, Sellafield, changes and the area changes with it. And it's all about temporalities, um, thinking about the past, living in the present, thinking about the future, but they're all intertwined. The collective outputs that, that you showed there also resonate with um, a, a sub-project that I did in uh, 2019 and 20, which was called Sellafield Site Futures. Um, we organized a couple of workshops in 2019 in Whitehaven, and those formed uh, the input for an exhibition by uh, Wallace Heim um, in 2020. What we were trying to think about there was what could the Sellafield site be or mean or do once it has been decommissioned in about 120 years time. So that was the key question. And in very free flowing uh, conversations with uh, professionals in the nuclear industry, with academics, with local artists and with other prof professionals from the area, we tried really to get a debate going about the possibilities that might be there for placemaking in the future. Because of course, when there's decommissioning happening, you have to think about what could happen next. And one of the things that came out of that was that um, especially the artists who were there felt a kind of sight envy. We were using maps also, and we were walking on maps and uh, they really said, well, it's very annoying that we cannot be there ourselves. And I think that really resonates with um, what was mentioned in the uh, really striking poem there. Uh, it's out of bounds to some people or to most people. Only very few people can go there. So there was a, um, a desire to be part of that actual site, um, to have more uh, transparency, more openness, and maybe uh, in the future be able to go there. And again, there was that ambivalence. Some people said, well, Sellafield could be a monument to human hubris. Others said it could be a monument to human expertise and success. Here's a few quotes from uh, the workshops. Um, we were really actually trying to move away from uh, the nuclear because what struck me in other workshops I went to over the past years was that whenever people think about um, futures for West Cumbria, it always comes back to new nuclear options, new nuclear build, or maybe um, an area for a deep geological facility. So we um, really expressly tried to take people away from thinking about uh, the more uh, direct future and really into 120 years from now. And as you can see from these quotes there, uh, people were really trying to do some um, science fiction, uh, trying to think of different kinds of societies that might be there with maybe a different kind of mobility, different kind of economics, a different kind of relationship with the future. But um, still people found it difficult to think about the future when everything is up for grabs. Now, I'm hoping to uh, try and work with that a bit more because um, I'm now embarking on this new project, which is all about uh, trying to uh, take uncertainties and ambivalence as opportunities for thinking about and making futures. So I will be working with scenario writing and uh, ecosystem modeling as forms of experimentation. I will be working with um, scholars in the Netherlands, uh, ecologists and a foresight studies person. 
and I'm really interested in models, in using modeling and why people always use models, as you saw also, of course, with uh, the pandemic over the past few years, always trying to tame the future uh, by using modeling. So I'm interested in experimenting with that. And I was also thinking, um, if you look at this photo here, this was kind of a, a model for the few, for, for the um, photo that I showed earlier. I hope you can see it again here. There you see how I turned that earlier round image into something quite neat and quite aesthetically pleasing as well. The, um, sorry, the model that, that we used there um, was done by um, making a photo with an iPhone through binoculars, through one lens of uh, binoculars. So models also stylize, so I find it interesting to um, to think about that and also what you did with the exhibit i think that's also a kind of modeling using photos um thinking about um the wrinkles that were there in the past the wrinkles that are there now in the present and how that will develop into futures so models allow you to um experiment with trends um sorry with temporalities and mimesis as the basic uh, human condition of looking back and looking forward and imitating um, is also, of course, always a transforming, never only a mimicking. So that's what I'm hoping to work with. And uh, what you've been doing there is really inspiring for me to, uh, to embark on this new project. So thank you so much. I will close this now. Thank you so much, Petrochitska. Yes, I'm back. Um, <laughs> and thank you for your reflections on that. It was really interesting, the things that you picked up on. Um, and I'd now like to take us into some more reflections, but sort of collective reflections where we can maybe um, respond to one, other, uh, one another, because certainly some of the things that you brought up there have, have triggered things that I found interesting. So I wonder if, uh, if at this point I can um, bring back Jade, and um, uh, and Philippa, um, just to introduce the sort of in conversation part. So um, before we go into that, it's probably worth saying um, that as many of you all have been doing, I've been monitoring the um, unfolding situation in Ukraine um, and the interactions of various people and things with um, nuclear materials in perhaps um, unexpected uh, unexpected ways. Um, and some of the questions or many of the same questions about radiation that my participants were asking about radiation in Fukushima in 2011 um, are being asked by people um, in uh, Ukraine at the moment around what are the levels of radiation, where can we get reliable information from, who's, who's even responsible for maintaining and storing that data when the data goes offline, um, who do we know, how do we know who to trust, uh, and how can we share this kind of data with others. That's obviously my sort of, my bent is on that side of things, whereas a lot of other people will be um, considering uh, the implications around climate change and energy mixes and the safety of nuclear installations, what happens to them when they are no longer operating and things like that. So um, I would like to reflect on that briefly um, and just to sort of, uh, yeah, basically take a, a moment to have a think about um, this sort of unusual position that we find ourselves in that I think um, I didn't anticipate having to think about some of the questions that we've been thinking about in the last couple of months now when we set up this nuclear futures project and we were first thinking about it probably back in September. I think it probably couldn't have been further from the truth. Everything around um, radiological installations tended to be sort of relatively fixed and stable within the bounds of instability that uh, the radioactive isotopes inherently suggest. Um, and so it's it's prompted actually a, a much more renewed focus on our relationship with 
nuclear things and nuclear places and what they mean to us and the things that they're tied up and um, interwoven with. Um, and I was particularly struck actually by, um, I, I love the idea of the whale fall um, that you introduced us to, Petrotska. That's, I think for me, that's so, um, uh, so evocative of the kind of layering of of different things as as we're looking say at Sellafield we're also looking at wind scale as it was at its previous MOD um, and uh, military histories and all these things that are kind of interwoven to these things that you can see on the top but you kind of do a little bit of digging or a little bit of investigating you can find more things interwoven and I was particularly I'm always interested in the visible and invisible because there are um, inherently that's that is sort of radiation we we have to do things to make it visible to to the human senses so with that um i would like us if i can bring up my questions that have just disappeared um i would like to um ask uh philippa a question um, and that question is going to be um in what ways do you think that the arts and creative writing processes can open off uh, open up opportunities for us to think about these kinds of new, potentially new nuclear futures that we hadn't sought to think about before? That's a brilliant question. Um, I think, you know, Petra's touched on this a little bit and at an event I was at recently, um, there was a lot of discussion. It was an event on nuclear waste storage and how to communicate with uh, communities on whether or not they, they wanted to um, welcome investigating nuclear waste being stored in their communities. Um, so I've been reflecting on this an awful lot recently. Obviously, you know, my research has been around trying to find through creative means, through storytelling, a way of understanding the complexities and the multiple viewpoints and the often conflicting or um, ambivalent viewpoints, both within the self and within families, within within communities. And I think that when we use a creative method, when we use storytelling as a way of investigating something, it kind of opens up by necessity an interdisciplinary mode of research where rather than, you know, focusing on a science aspect or a geographical aspect or um, a communication aspect, you bring all those things together and you look at how they all interact and are able to then navigate through that to both understand where we've come from and where we are and how and why we feel that way, but also to speculate forwards. Um, and I was really impressed, actually, because um, I use psychogeography as a method of connecting with landscape and, and starting off that storytelling process. So really going to landscapes, observing them, even landscapes that I'm familiar with. You know, I was so familiar with the landscape of, of Anglesey and around Wilver. And then when I started going in and visiting it specifically to, to, to examine how it made me feel and behave and to question why, um, I learned so much more from that and from having conversations with other people who either visited or lived there. Um, so I'm quite grounded in my research in that sense. But um, at a recent event, I was at a nuclear waste um, event. Um, I met this fantastic academic called Anna Wilson, who's just moved from the University of Stirling to the University uh, to Glasgow University. Um, and she was talking about using speculative fiction to get people to sort of imagine where they want to be and to draw on all the anxieties they have now and to kind of speculate forwards in what seems like often quite a sci-fi way of thinking to unravel some of those feelings and emotions and also to kind of visualize what kind of future they wanted and i think you know i'm really interested in combining those those ideas of thinking about where we're from, where we are now, and looking forwards into where we might become. And I think storytelling is a fantastic way of accessing those subconscious feelings and thoughts that we have and finding a narrative that we can either then understand the complexities of the, this situation more deeply and or then project forwards and start to think what kind of stories do we want to create um how do we want to imagine our, our futures to be and and where would we like to take this so i do think the arts have a huge role to play and i also think there is the opportunity then to reach people who otherwise would find you know the science and the geography and and you know some of the 
political side of things sometimes a little inaccessible if you don't have the language to understand the terminology you don't understand all the acronyms you don't you know it's a bit like being in line of duty sometimes isn't it when there's just acronyms flying around all over the place and i think that for the general public getting them engaged in in storytelling and seeing things in a way that's more accessible can often get people to reflect on and question um and accept and understand and express themselves in a way that showing them a report or a piece of research often can't do. People can shut down when they don't have the, the sort of specific language skills to deal with that. But people do love a good story. So I think it's a great way of engaging wider groups with these sort of difficult and complex issues, really. Thank you. That's making me think um, a little bit of my own sort of professional speculative uh, fiction, I would say, which comes in the form of um, so when I'm not being a PhD student, I also work in emergency management um, and, and worked at Sellafield contributing to sort of imagined futures of when things go wrong, what we might do. And there are really interesting sort of very short speculative future generally where people on site tend to think very much about the speculative future of what happens when it gets to the site boundary and how do we stop that. But actually a lot of the speculative futures that we're talking about to do with Sellafield and other nuclear sites, they have such long temporal ex existence that the, the time scales for those futures and those fictions are very different. Um, yeah. And also the methods of communicating. So another thing I'm interested in is how do we communicate through generations? Mm -hmm. um, because there's a risk, you know, the the thing that you jump on initially is, well, you, you need to mythologize it. You create myths and legends to stop people going digging around in, in nuclear waste repositories. But that didn't really work very well for the Egyptians. It didn't take very long before those, you know, cursed spaces and, and those warnings not to go into the pyramids were ignored and people went and investigated them anyway. So you know there's how do we communicate through deep time when we know that language will evolve um and language evolves re you know incredibly rapidly and we don't know what the future is going to be like at all we don't know whether it's going to be more technologically advanced or less technologically advanced you know will there be a revolution where there's the, the internet disappears and people become very community based again so how do we communicate through deep time, so I'm quite fascinated by that, and I think I think you're right. What you're doing is is speculating in a quite a dystopian and dark way. What happens if things go wrong? But I think it's also helpful to speculate what happens if things go right, mm -hmm. and how you know how what do we then hope for? Where where do we want to direct that story by speculating about all the things that we could do to make the sort of the the overarching nuclear journey come to a really positive place a positive conclusion rather than you know this and, and things are very unsettled now um as you mentioned unfortunately um but yeah i think it's i think there's a lot of exciting possibilities yeah fantastic thank you i'm just going to ask if if petra or jade wanted to respond to anything that philip has said and i'm just going to open the door and let my dog in because she's making a lot of noise because I've, I've ejected her but um, Philip or um, sorry, Philip or Dave, Petra Jitsko or Jade, did you have anything that you wanted to respond to to what Philip has said? Oh uh, yeah, I wanted to say that I absolutely agree with um, using the creative arts. I feel like, especially in my discipline um, with a lot of the sciences, um, there isn't really that much space. For uh, exploring these things through, you know, creative media, and I think it's just so important to use that with um, uh, different disciplines, different uh, spheres, social spheres, um, to engage with, as you said, Philippa, wider, um, wider groups, and uh, then we can. I think I genuinely believe that through this we can then start to unfold different uh, nuclear futures more clearly so yeah yes uh, i totally agree as well and and i also think that that some art and interventions can be quite provocative maybe and make people perhaps see things uh, rather differently um, it was very interesting when we did the um, 
the exhibition with um, with Wallace Heim, who'd made sculptures inspired by those workshops, um, which were about future future making. Um, it struck me that that uh, people who came to the opening of the exhibition didn't always know how to take these sculptures what, that that she'd made, how to think about them, how to reflect on them, and um, and that was interesting as such. I thought you could say, well, it wasn't clear to to people; they didn't know what message to take from them. But of course. Um, I, I think it's it's really interesting if you make people sometimes feel rather uncomfortable. <laughs> but uh, yeah. it may not be a popular thing to say, but um, also, no. or, or, of course the nuclear makes people feel uh, quite uncomfortable sometimes, but not in West Cumbria. So in that sense, I, I found it interesting to see people um, uh, pushed a little bit in, in different ways. I think you're quite right that, you know, when we look at the arts, they, they're not always about answering questions, but quite often encouraging people to ask their own questions um, and to reconsider. And I'm really interested in that process of defamiliarisation. So, you know, what I found really interesting when I was doing my research around Wilbur was so many people were so familiar with, with Wilbur, they didn't even question it. But when someone was trying to put so, solar panels in a field, everyone went, sort of really against it because they felt it was somehow damaging the the view of the countryside by having solar panels in a field but the the nuclear power station on the coastline was was so much a part of the landscape by that point and in their minds because they were familiar with it then they didn't question it and so i think there's all these real complexities about um there's a difference between visiting a landscape that has those nuclear issues and bringing all those preconceptions to it and being really aware of it and when you're actually living an emplaced embodied life in that landscape and it becomes part of your normal everyday um, view or interactions we have a different response to it and I think that's that's what's so fun to unpick and to, to question and I think you're quite right that that you know by challenging people to to ask questions through art is a great way of getting those conversations going and getting people to 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 think differently about things. Thank you. Um, I wonder if I can ask a question of Jade now, which is going to take us in a slightly different tack, which is thinking more on the technical side of things. And I wanted to ask about um, which ways might technical changes to nuclear fuels, and that's obviously your your um, your other side of your interest from your PhD side of things. What does that offer in terms of a potential for uh, different nuclear futures? Yeah, so just to give a bit of um, a background on what I'm working on now. So um, I'm working on fuels that are accident tolerant um, and these would be through their inherent properties and they would give a reactor operators more time to save a reactor in the case of an accident uh, scenario. And um, the accident tolerance of these fuels could significantly change the course of an accident um, in such a scenario, which um, may then contribute to the way that uh, nuclear is perceived or it may even not contribute to the way nuclear is perceived. Um, so I think I think there is a lot of influence um, around and in the technology of uh, nuclear power uh, in different futures. And I think it also shows the complexities in considering all these multiplicities of a technology because there is that there, there are just so many um, uh, elements that sort of uh, entangle with each other. You know, you've got your um, societal, your technical, your political, economical, ecological. It's it's all intertwined, and I think, um, yeah, I think the way that the industry is going now with looking at new technologies, new fuels, new claddings. Um, it's just providing all of these different nuclear futures with each sort of branch that they're going into. 
Thank you. I didn't know if Petra or Philippa, if you guys had anything to respond to that. So it's obviously a very a sort of different way of looking at things um, and potential futures and uh, how those might change. Yeah, I'm really interested in the idea of, of that risk minimisation. I think one of the things that people can be quite anxious about is that the fear of nuclear accident, um, because at the end of the day, it comes down to human error a lot of the time. Humans design nuclear power stations, humans run nuclear power stations and humans are fallible. So the idea of sort of safety proofing it, I think is really interesting and that can develop a whole new narrative on how people feel about living in proximity to or welcoming new nuclear power stations. Um, so I'm absolutely fascinated by that and where how that message might be once that technology is developed, how that message might be shared with people and how that might change people's views based on responding to, to sort of past incidents like Chernobyl and Fukushima and wind scale and you know how that might then redirect that kind of public perception of nuclear power stations. I'm really interested in rhetoric, so I would be really interested to see how how a new technology like that is, as it were, being being promoted or sold to yeah. uh, to different publics. So, um, so 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 of course we, because technology is fascinating and um, and 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 yes, of course, is problematic because of human error. But also, as as we are seeing now with, with what's what's happening uh, in in Ukraine and the threats there, it also depends, of course, how it is being used and to what purposes and by whom, and um and 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 that's something that that I tend to worry a lot about. Not the risk really of the technology as such and the the human error, but but uh, really that there's um that not everyone is pleasant and willing to uh, work for the best of of the planet and in that sense also uh, there's always of course the the problem of waste which which uh, to me is is something that that um is still uh not fully addressed in the sense that um, even with a deep geological uh, repository, uh, it means that you you kind of pave the way for for new build, if you will, without actually addressing that that problem. So I'm really interested in the politics and rhetorics around that. Thank you. And last but not least, I've got a, pet, uh, a question for Petra Chitska, which is to um, think about what kind of um, ways or what do you think the extent that um, nuclear decommissioning might open up opportunities for imaginative um, humanitarian, humanitarian research, humanities, sorry, um, humanities research? Right. Yes, yes. Nuclear decommissioning, of course, um, we, we mentioned it already. It has all this sedimentation there. There's time involved in in everything. The time has has passed. Time is still passing whilst decommissioning goes on for years and years. And then there's environmental re remediation. So I, I think time temporalities are a really interesting aspect for for the social sciences to to work on. But also there's of course the technology. There's the materials. And material science, which is which is totally fascinating, and with this turn that you've seen in the humanities, uh, looking at um, materials, materiality, um, nuclear decommissioning is of course a really really interesting uh, one. Uh, also because of um, the nuclear waste management, that's an intrinsic uh, part of it. So um, so that's that's really. Um, that opens up all kinds of possibilities, I think, for humanities research, the politics, the, the rhetorics, as I mentioned before, but also um, in the in the poem, one of the um, stanzas there was about um, the disappearing of the iconic golf ball or the ponds or, or um, other iconic structures. And of course, you, you may wonder whether that really needs to happen or not. Um, so heritage is something that, that one might uh, think about. And Egler 
uh, Rinzi V. Chutish is doing this really interesting project on a nuclear heritage. So that's also uh, a humanities um, perspective, I guess, on, uh, on decommissioning. Well, what I find less interesting is that sometimes as a social scientist, um, when you're talking with people in the industry, they uh, expect you to smoothen the message for them or something. They always think that social scientists are interested in uh, communication as such. And maybe we are interested in that, but as a phenomenon that's there and not a uh, not to be a cheap consultant for uh, for the industry, so uh, so that that's something that that I find less um, leading to less imaginative uh, research, if you will. Well, I I actually wanted to ask, sorry, a, a sneaky follow on question, which was um, how you found your research was kind of taken on. Or uh, on site. So from my own understanding of site, I think they would probably think like, why are you interested in these kinds of questions? What is that even for? And I think with my own research sort of between the sort of the technical construction of radiation knowledge with these really technical devices and, and machines and numbers and things that are really precise and specific, leading you to these very sort of solid ways of thinking about things. And then social science and particularly STS and anthropology, they tend to ask all of these questions that start to unpick and like niggle away at things and unsettle everybody and cause you to be really confused and like think about the things that you held as quite solid things previously. So I wondered if they kind of even get what you're asking and and what you're thinking about. Do they or do they just kind of give you what you need and then kind of continue going on about their own business or how are they receiving that? I think it depends really very much on the discussion partner. There's like with any kind of field work, there's people that um, that find it interesting or, or are a bit intrigued. And then they even might feel that there's some insights that they want to take away from what you're doing. And... Um, the, the the fact indeed that it generates more questions this kind of research than that it solves anything is um annoying to some people and uh attractive i guess to others so sometimes you get a conversation where, where you feel well we really hit it off there and then that person will want to participate in a workshop or um, um or have a follow-up interview and with other people, it it doesn't work that way. So you always get these these different um, experiences, I guess, with uh, with discussion partners um, in the field. Thank you, um, Philip or Jade. Did you have any questions that you wanted to ask of Petra? I'm oh, Jade, uh, Philippa, I think you're on mute. So. Yeah. I'm quite interested in your research project and the access that you have to people because um, I found I got a really mixed response when I told people about my PhD and I was trying to talk to people who were involved in the nuclear industry. I think as soon as I mentioned I was a writer, some people really shut down and, and felt quite suspicious that I was going to be unpicking things or revealing secrets that um, I shouldn't be revealing. Other people really were quite interested in the angles that I was taking um, and and sort of why were interested in why I was interested in in the issues um, but I you know it's interesting to hear your response that you know some of it is about how those conversations go and whether or not you the, that communication kind of hits off with people or whether you know different people's expectations of of what you're doing but presumably your part of your research was to have access and do interviews like that um so did, did you find that having that structure helped you to, to to sort of access people to talk to yes ha having that access also to site um, really helped and also 
um, having been introduced to some high ranking people in the industry, because at Sellafield, my, my impression is that once something is being championed by a senior manager, uh, other people are, are willing to give it a go. It's, it's quite a hierarchical um, setup in, in that sense. Um, but 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 again, uh, I, I I still think it very much depends on on the the individual, and I think that's 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 okay. Also, I've I've not been trying to get any kind of let's say representative um, slice of people who work for Sellafield or or who are somehow affiliated with Sellafield. It's more that. As an anthropologist, I guess I've, I've been looking for certain patterns by doing a, a wide range of interviews. But for example, one, one of the things I, I found a bit um, um, frustrating is that it's been difficult to have lots of conversations with people um, who actually work in operations, simply because uh, with snowball sampling uh, in interviewing, you get sent from one person to another and they always send you from one manager or one scientist or engineer to another. And it was difficult to kind of penetrate into um, uh, into more shop floor uh, situations. Let's say. Yeah, almost like it, it became organized on a certain level. And yes. Yeah, so I found with my research, a lot of it was serendipitous and just taking opportunities and talking to people and going going to various events. Although at one point, the, the most senior person that I spoke to, and I'm not going to mention who they were or what the situation was, but they were incredibly helpful and really open and, we, you know, gave me access to areas that I wouldn't normally be able to have access to. Um, and then as the conversation went, they offered me a job. And then uh, within half an hour, we're saying, you know, we'd, we'd like to have a job, but you'll have to sign this non-disclosure agreement so you won't be able to write your book. And I, I was kind of thinking, oh, is that why you're offering me the job to so that I stop writing? Um, but they were, but they were they were one of the most helpful people actually and i think the pride in what they were doing and their excitement of what they were doing just came through in those very sort of natural conversations and so i you know it's i, I felt like i was also being a little bit suspicious and that maybe they were just really excited about the conversation that we were ha having if that makes sense so i think um that kind of serendipitous sort of ethnographic research is is really valuable in terms of understanding those complexities um, of people's emotional responses um, to nuclear power working within the kind of the nuclear family that nuclear power stations or nuclear sites create because I do think there is a kind of a sense of a family there's a brilliant film um, by a filmmaker um, called oh, I'm gonna forget her name now it's Vicky I will come up with the name the film's called um The Atom a Love Affair um and if you get a chance to see it um I think it's available online you can subscribe to it but there's often screenings that are that are held by various institutions um I organized a screening um, at the university where I used to work before I moved to Staffordshire University. Um, and it looks at it interviews. It has the most amazing series of interviews with people who work in the nuclear industry all across the world, America, Europe, the UK. And what comes through is that real sense of sort of community around a particular nuclear site. And that's kind of they often describe it as a feeling of being part of a family, mm -hmm. like an actual nuclear family. Um, yeah. And I think some of that came through on our research day, didn't it, Louise and Jade? I think, you know, people were quite often talking about that sense of comradeship and um, working together. And I, and I find that, you know, really interesting because I imagine it's an incredibly important part of the job is to have those really strong relationships with your colleagues, but also with the role that you're performing as well. Right. Yeah. And what's so interesting about decommissioning also is that it's about change and transformation, because from an operating company, Sellafield is, is now uh, becoming a so-called 
um, environmental remediation company, which means a different type of working. So it's also difficult to um, to hold on to those values uh, that that were there before. So that makes it extra interesting to me in terms of they evolve. They evolve perhaps into a kind of problem solving, um, kind of hopeful, fixing an issue kind of different kind of mission, I suppose, which I think could be quite interesting. Yeah, and some people find it uh, awful, of course, because they like their routine way of working. So that that's uh, very yeah. interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I wanted to open up the floor now to um, to our other our, our listeners, our audience, um, in particular, probably Nikki, who was the, the maker of all um, sort of interactive um, non non bleeping Geiger counter. Um, we've had many discussions about what a Geiger counter should and shouldn't do. Um, and so, Nikki, I didn't know if you wanted to respond. Um, you, and come on, I can uh, for anybody who doesn't want to be on camera, I'm quite happy for you not to, not to be. And also, um, I'm happy to chop off this section if anybody doesn't want to be recorded. Hi, Nikki. Hi, uh, I'm all discombobulated and looking at screens that don't match the camera. Hang on. <laughs> it always freaks me out when I'm looking in the wrong direction. <laughs> there you go. Hi. <laughs> um, uh, sorry, could you ask the question again? <laughs> I just said I, I really loved um, your um, your your non beeping Geiger counter, having had many discussions with you about sort of the the proper behaviour of these devices that tell us about where things are. And your one particularly doesn't beep; it, it kind of pokes it pokes radiation out of things um, and can play a tune on beer <laughs> beer cans and uh, on rocks. And so I wondered if you um, if if the rest of the um, evenings talk had, had prompted you to reflect on anything in relation to making radiation visible or your own work? Mm. I think I think just going off sort of what, what you've just said there, I think it's interesting. I'm always interested in interfaces and how how technology makes us behave. Like you're talking about how the technology how the technology should behave. I'm always interested in in how how that changes how we interact and sort of move through different different landscapes and stuff like that. I think um, in terms of the panel discussion, I found myself I'm kind of grasping at kind of some half baked themes. It feels to me like there's something in the idea of convergence and divergence that I kind of want to kind of scratch out a bit more, but kind of too many processing things going on right now. But, um, like the value in people coming together, which I think the, the sort of the collaborative poem kind of exemplifies in some way, but that riffing off of people in order to get to some something different. And it feels like different parts of the conversation have kind of returned to that. And just thinking back to sort of different future envisioning exercises I've been involved in and how it's kind of relied on those interactions between people to push us beyond those first kind of immediate things that we we think of to push and push and push to those more interesting and sort of more disconcerting kinds of um like speculations about futures be they sort of utopic or dystopic or you know neither nor or both at the same time and all those kinds of things and um yeah, and I think that also sort of comes together in the storytelling as well, that bringing together of, of people and then when things diverge and that story doesn't hold or it evolves or it no longer has the power or you've got, you know, sort of malevolent sort of um, forces coming in wanting to steer things in, in different directions. So I don't know, maybe just sort of throw that back at people as a as a sort of like a seed for, for further conversation but yeah it just feels that there's some there's something there underneath thank you did anybody want to take up the seed in response and that also goes for um the other the other watchers and listeners and uh, audience members feel free to kind of come on and um chip in we've got another few minutes just left of the um of the event and it'd be great to hear more from those of you who haven't spoken today, if you are interested or if it's made you think of uh, anything in particular. 
in in terms of convergence and divergence, I I find it really interesting how from the outside a certain area is seen in a specific way. For example, West Cumbria um, has been conceptualized as um, um, kind of suffering under the burden of of the nuclear, with which I found and other people found before me that that is perhaps more of an outsider's vision. So you have this this perception on the inside, from the inside, and then a perception from the outside that that may not uh, converge, um, which is also interesting in terms of uh, familiarizing and defamiliarizing, because some some uh, assumptions are often made that then don't hold when you're there. But what I find interesting too then is how certain uh, perspectives, certain perceptions um, may hold in in a specific area, but then maybe in tension with um, kind of global perceptions now about, for example, climate change or having to do things differently. So that's just something that, that comes up for me when I th- think about a convergence and divergence. Thank you, Nikki. Yeah, I think it's kind of making me think of um what things to kind of have to converge and diverge or converge to hold just enough to get the next thing to move on and then they can kind of diverge again and then they hold enough so I don't know it might be around a particular narrative or a particular story say of a a new fuel that can solve something or or act in a way that is enough to get the next step to be taken to, to take a different step I suppose. I think part of that is sort of um, where we come, so my background is as a, as a visual artist and where we've had people talking about their experiences of becoming embedded in different situations and communities and in contexts like that. I think th- there's opposing forces, like you kind of want to sort of blend in and be approachable and be empathetic and stuff, but also I think a lot of our role is in being just different enough to be useful as well. Like, if we just come in and only bring more of the same, then that's 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 not helping with that catalyzing of moving, like shifting things on to the next stable configuration. Is that like well back to disruption again, aren't we? But um, yeah, being just different enough <laughs> as kind of internal external researchers of different types. I think there's um there's some really good um research on just good enough data as well um and it's looking at citizen science data on radiation monitoring and it talks about um although professional scientists and I'll, I'll use sort of bunny ears for that professional scientists who know how to do science properly might contest the way that these data this data around environmental contamination um uh, is produced or the the tools that people use the end result might be that it's just good enough to to prompt another conversation so that the proper people can come and monitor and find the same things as the just good enough data sort of indicated that they should have done. So sometimes there can be use in these kind of just just good enough or just sort of niggly enough or just unsettling enough to make people think differently about it's things. It's about pushing that conversation forwards, isn't it? And And building incrementally. And and outward as well, building outward. So you're not just following the same path, but you start to investigate uh, sort of multiple potential paths. And I think that's really exciting. And it's it's interesting that we often talk about futures in terms of dystopian and utopian. And I think that both of those are, are constructs. They, you know, it's not one or the other. They, that idea that it's binary. Um, I think you know every utopia has a dystopian side to it, and every dystopia has a utopian side to it you know certainly in in utopian narratives it's one person's utopia can be someone else's dystopia within the same story and I think sort of trying to break down that idea that it's binary and starting to look at the nuances within it is where it gets interesting um and And I think that's something yeah that's the, the interesting thing with with nuclear things is that often they are portrayed as um so Gabriel Hesh talks about um like the sort of uh banality or the specialism or the, the sort of uh 
the ways that nuclear discourses tend to be structured tend to be around it's either so banal that you don't really pay any attention to it um, and therefore it kind of slips under the radar or it's so exceptional that it's not subject to the normal ways that we would either um, interrogate or govern certain activities so it kind of managed to slip between the, both of them yeah. and it's never it's never this sort of normal thing that actually we we kind of live with but still is governed in the same way that we might want to govern other um, high risk industries or, or different ways of thinking about things. Um, at this point, Joe, can I can I invite you back on? Certainly can. Hello. I wondered if Hi. you thank you very much, Nikki. I noticed you've you've sort of snuck off as soon as I let you. <laughs> I've digitally snuck, snuck back off to her, her chair, um, but I wondered if um, I can invite you to sort of say any final words before I close the session in just a couple of minutes. I mean, yeah, it was absolutely fascinating. It was so interesting. Um, one of my former bits of research was on, was on disasters and thinking about um, the kind of role of residual materialities. And I think it's just so interesting thinking about that in relation to nuclear because you have these visible residual materialities, you have these buried uh, material, uh, materialities that sort of exist beneath the soil and then you have these kind of materialities that need to be picked up by a Geiger counter or maybe even imagined as well and um, so I think it's just it's such an interesting um, yeah such an interesting topic to research and I think you really succeeded in pulling out some of the many different dimensions of this and, th and, and different ways of approaching which I found really really rich and really stimulating and I, you know, I was just looking just looking just now Boris Johnson's just announced is it fight um, that the UK is going to build a, a nuclear power station a year to wean us off our dependence on Russian oil which again I think is so interesting thinking about kind of different imaginaries around energy futures how they how you kind of have yeah weaning off oil on one hand being played in opposition to weaning up on nuclear and then you have debates around um you know the onshore wind farm kind of coming to discussions around nuclear so they, you have all these imaginaries all these futures all these visions and materiality circling like circulating all these kind of entanglements as you say uh, and it seems like such a rich a rich and sort of fertile area to explore so yeah i just want to thank you so much for such an exciting uh bit of, but i kind of you know i got louise and particularly i've been working with louise and but jade I, it's been going quite a while now and i kind of in some ways want it just to carry on just for you to do a sort of secret, you know, and a kind of like a never ending sequence of events. But I think you have probably got other things that you need to be doing. So I can't really expect you to be doing that. But yeah, thank you so much. Well, in which case, I wanted to end on um, on on our sort of final um, collective um, uh, outcome or output for the project, which was a collective map. And Philippa touched on this um, in terms of um, the ways that we got some of the participants to engage with um, on the day in October, but also um, interwoven with some of those reflections and um, a sort of visual representation, I think, actually, of um, of Petra Titska's, uh whale fell. Is it whale fell or whale fall? Fall. Sorry, it's my writing on my my pad of paper, um, and and this sort of layering of all of these different things that are ongoing. Um, but before I do, or whilst I'm doing that, I do want to say a massive thank you to Petra Chipska, um, to Philippa, to Jade, to Joe, to Nikki, um, and to everybody who's participated in the project. It's been um, uh, it's been an interesting one. Um, and I should say that the final um, image that I'm going to show you is actually um, was uh, um, drawn together with um, a Ukrainian artist um, in Kharkiv who um, has been trying to help me with this whilst um, uh, anti-air defense missile systems have been going off in the background in some of our calls. So. Um, quite an interesting project for him to engage with um, and I met him via um, one of my radiation monitoring groups that I know um, through radiation monitoring in Japan um, and that's been quite interesting speaking to him and reflecting with him so um, I just wanted to share that with you now which is our um, collective map which hopefully you should see Ooh, hold on one second Sorry. There we go. Um, so 
without further ado, thank you very much, everybody. Um, the image you can see in front of you is from um, Sasha Alexander um, Lisevi, and it's built from uh, a load of data that we collected or um, that was collected around a radiation monitoring tour in Cumbria around some of the reflections, some of the locations um, that mean things. And we wanted to try and create this kind of layering, overlapping, um, colourful nature that you kind of want to scratch underneath, but you can't quite work out what's going on or make sense of it. And some bits of it come out clear, other bits less so. So thank you so much, everybody, for your time um, and your input into today's session. Um, I'm sure, or I think the intention is, Joe, that we'll um, have the recording available um, on the Nuclear Futures um, uh, web page that's part of the CSS website. So thank you so much, everybody. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, we've enjoyed putting it on for you. Um, and it's been uh, it's been great hearing all of that today. <laughs>